This broadcast is the property of Codependence Anonymous. Reproduction without written permission from Codependence Anonymous is not permitted. Richard, and uh, I am just delighted to be doing this today. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is is how to be sponsored. Now, pretty much everything that I have to say today and tomorrow uh, comes from a workshop that we initially developed at uh, the Experience, Strength, and Hope group in Saskatoon. Uh, uh, as a full day workshop in a round table discussion format. And we've since done it again here in Winnipeg. Um, and then the idea came along to do this thing and, and how could we uh, accommodate that? So we've broken it into the two days and today we're going to talk about how to be sponsored and tomorrow we'll talk about how to sponsor. Um, but I do need to caution everybody that this started as a full day of round table discussion. And we're trying to pare the content down to an hour today, an hour tomorrow with question and answer afterward. Uh, so we're going to just see how that goes. Um, but today, like I said, we want to talk about how to be sponsored. Uh, first, we need to kind of establish what, what is sponsorship. And, and uh, for me, uh, just personally, I'm, and, and what I have to say today is going to bounce back and forth between a little bit of our code of literature and my own experience. Um, for me, what, what sponsorship amounts to is, I think of it as the catalyst of recovery. And if you think back to when you were in, in high school taking a chemistry class and, and how they defined a catalyst, a catalyst is that substance uh, or that either initiates or accelerates uh, a chemical process. And that's really what, what sponsorship does for me in my recovery. I really didn't get going in, in recovery until I had a sponsor. Um, and periodically as, as I've plateaued and then switched sponsors and, and got a, a fresh infusion of sponsorship, uh, my ex my recovery has been seen to accelerate, and that's what it's done for me. But when we talk about uh, about what it actually is, uh, I I would refer to uh, our our booklet sponsorship. What's in it for me? And. Uh, in part one, it talks about recovery from codependence cannot be done alone. Allowing another person to sponsor us provides us with a safe place to practice being in a relationship. Over time, permitting someone to get to know us through self-disclosure, working the code of steps and traditions, and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable offers a new perspective about intimacy and trust. What a sponsor what sponsorship is for me is that place that I can go to, to get a guide. And it's that idea of, you know, if you're entering a, a, a wilderness that you've never been in before and you need to get, you need to get uh, from point A to point B, one of the most useful things that you can have is a guide, someone who has walked the path that you want to go and knows where the pitfalls are, knows, the areas to stay away from and, and, and maybe even knows the shortcuts. Uh, that's a sponsor. Uh, one of the ways that I like to think about that is, is that uh, recovery is a little bit like, like a foreign language. When we first come in, you know, uh, people are, are talking to us and they're using all of this recovery jargon, uh, uh, let it go, turn it over uh, one day at a time. And a sponsor is somebody who speaks the language of recovery. You know, if you're going to learn a foreign language, what's the best way to learn a foreign language? Well, it's, it, it, it's uh, through immersion. And uh, uh, the best place to get that is from people who, who speak the language. So uh, that's one of the things that a sponsor amounts to is a translator for me of you know, recovery to to uh, English, English to recovery dictionary. Uh, why it's important to have a sponsor is, is because when I got to recovery, 
uh, I don't know about you guys, but, but when I got here, my head wasn't all there. Uh, I was confused. I was angry. I was scared. I was frustrated. And my perception of the world around me uh, uh, didn't have a lot to do with what was actually going on. And what I need is that outside perspective. Uh, when it, we talk about uh, uh, oh man, uh, sorry, I'm confusing my notes here. Uh, and this is this is part of why I, I really like to to do the roundtable discussion format because uh, at, a, at a moment like this, I can throw out a question, get you guys to answer it while I think of what I'm going to say next. Uh, but it is, it is absolutely important for me to have a sponsor because um, I'm codependent. And I have this spiritual illness that changes the way that I see the world around me. Um, and what a sponsor does is it helps to introduce me to reality, uh, to another way of looking at things. Um, sponsor is somebody who can uh, show me the path to where I want to go. Um, another thing that a sponsor does, if you look at our booklet, uh, uh, Building Code of Communities, uh, there's a, a really good section in there. I think maybe the, our, our single best piece of writing on the subject of sponsorship. Uh, sponsorship provides a relationship within which codependents learn to integrate the, the CODA steps and traditions into their lives. Healthy sponsorship in CODA is the antithesis of a codependent relationship. It is an equal partnership in which sponsor and sponsee can explore and practice recovery behaviors. Sponsorship provides a rich arena for both parties to learn to share without becoming enmeshed, without dictating, and without taking things personally. Um, that's something I wanted to emphasize, that without taking things personally. Um, I don't know, again, I don't know about you, but for me, uh, when I got here, uh, I was suffered from this weird combination of uh, low self-esteem, and extreme self-centeredness. It was like I was the piece of shit at the center of the universe. Uh, I'm not much, but it's all about me. And uh, uh, what I what I found uh, gradually in 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 a sponsorship relationship was the ability to hear constructive criticism or or to uh, to uh, deal with somebody who, who was busy and understand that their being busy was not about me being less than. Uh, that idea of without taking it personally. Uh, to carry on, sponsors impart the experience, strength, and hope they have, they have garnered in working and studying the steps and traditions. A sponsor listens intently and patiently. A healthy sponsorship relationship helps build trust. Uh, one of the promises that we have in uh, in Codependence Anonymous talks about how I will learn to trust those who are trustworthy. And again, my experience with that is that I always did that backwards. You know, I I uh, trusted all sorts of people who were untrustworthy, and uh, didn't trust the people that I could have that I could have trusted. And part of the reason that I did that. Um, is that the untrustworthy people had this magical formula for getting me to trust them, uh, being codependent. They, they, would, they would say to me something like, don't you trust me? Well, now I have to trust them or they'll think I don't trust them. And that's the way my codependency affects me. And, and being in a relationship with a sponsor was uh, one of those first relationships where I, I, I could – see that this was a trustworthy person and I could trust them and have it turn out well. Um, an important aspect, carrying on, an important aspect of sponsoring is passing on the institutional memory of our fellowship. A sponsor may share information about the structures, the local, regional, 
and worldwide communities of the Coda Fellowship. A sponsor also plays an important role in sharing about the culture of Coda. For instance, how our meetings are conducted, the protocol of behavior in, in a sharing group, and the harmfulness of crosstalk. That's an important aspect of things, is that you know, my, my first sponsor was also my teacher in meeting etiquette and how to behave in a meeting and what to expect from a meeting. And uh, I think that's uh, particularly important in CODA. I don't know if you've, if you've noticed as you look around our rooms, but we are the crossroads of recovery. We have people coming in who've got no experience with 12-step fellowship. We've got people coming in uh, who have extensive experience with other fellowships that look a little different. And what a, a sponsor can convey is, hey, this is how things work here. Uh, they can also uh, provide a safe place for detailed sharing. And I'll carry on with, with one last little passage here from, uh, again, from uh, uh, Building Coda Communities. Having one-on-one -on -one time with a sponsor outside of the meeting gives sponsees the opportunity to do step work and to share feelings in greater depth than is possible during the meeting. This experience helps sponsees to share more succinctly during the meeting. Sponsorship relationships promote growth for both partners and help to improve the overall health of the group. As a sponsor, when someone comes to me um, and asks me to sponsor them, we sit down and we have a little chat. And we talk about what that looks like to both of us. And, and, and more than anything, uh, what I want to accomplish there is the, the things that I ask of a sponsee. Um, and one of the things that I ask of my sponsees is, is uh, to do what I try to do, which is that I don't take my problems to a meeting. I take them to my sponsor. Um, I, so I will take my problem to a meeting if it's in the context of experience, strength, and hope. So what that means is that for me, a fair share is uh, this is the problem that's going on in my life and I talk to my sponsor and this is what I propose to do about it and this is how I hope it turns out. Or this is the problem I was having and I talked to my sponsor and this is what I did about it and this is how it turned out. Um, and what I, what I hope I never share in a meeting is uh, this is what's going on in my life and I don't know what to do and I'm screwed. Uh, because that's not the experience, strength, and hope that we're trying to, to, to share in our meetings. And I ask my sponsees to, to do the same thing. That idea that uh, uh, when we've only got three to five minutes to share uh, individually at a meeting, what we want to do is, is to uh, make sure that we're focused on carrying a message of code of recovery because the fifth tradition tells us that the most important person in that meeting is that newcomer and, and, and uh, the sharing in the meeting needs to be something that holds out uh, a, a possibility of hope for that newcomer. Um, that, that particular passage out of building code of communities ends with the phrase healthy sponsorship builds healthy meetings. Uh, so if we've established that it's important for me to have a sponsor, um, my next thing is, well, uh, who, who, who would I ask to be my sponsor? What do I look for in a sponsor? There's a terrific list in uh, sponsorship. What's in it for me? Um, where it talks about the characteristics of a sponsor, um, so, uh, having a code of sponsor gives us a chance to participate in and experience a healthier relationship. The best way to pick a sponsor is to remain open to guidance from our higher power. A few practical considerations follow. We start the process by considering what kind of person we might want as a sponsor. Do we want someone who requires daily contact or would we rather call less frequently? And, and I would interject there that, that Either of those is fine. Every sponsorship relationship is a, a relationship between two individuals. And uh, there's no one answer to that particular question. It's, it's what works for those two people. Um, next, do we look for someone who gives assignments or do we 
prefer in-depth discussions. It is common for both to occur. And again, both are just fine. Whatever works for those two people. Uh, do we check out someone who is familiar but who may not possess these qualities for which we are striving? Ideally, we choose a sponsor who exhibits those characteristics that will allow us to meet our present needs. Now, in general, when, when a newcomer asks me what, uh, who they should ask to sponsor, I, I suggest to them that they come to several meetings and, and they engage in the fellowship after the meeting and they get to know some people and they look for the person who has the recovery they want because that's the whole point of this thing. Sponsorship started uh, when, when all of, everything good in our fellowship we stole from AA, of course, including sponsorship. And sponsorship started when, when uh, a uh, broken down uh, proctologist in Akron, Ohio, met a failed stockbroker visiting from New York who, who had been sober for a little while. And they had this conversation that, that amounted to, uh, he understands my problem. Maybe he can help me. That's, that's the essence of sponsorship. We have a saying in our rooms, if you want what I've got, do what I did. Um, and sponsorship amounts to the idea that if, if my problem looks like your problem, then maybe the things that will work for you will work for me. And asking for sponsorship amounts to going to somebody and saying, I love the recovery I see in you. Can you show me how you did that? That's, that's all that's involved in asking for sponsorship. So what we suggest is look around the rooms, find somebody who's experienced that recovery that you want, and ask them for help. So the next two pages in, in uh, uh, sponsorship, what's in it for me, just give a bullet point list of characteristics of CODA sponsors. And uh, we'll just explore a couple of these for a few minutes here. Um, first, they, they place recovery first. Well, of course they do. Um, what I've learned here is that anything that I put in front of my recovery, I'm guaranteed to lose. Um, it doesn't matter what it is because my recovery is what equips me to have a good life. Um, and the minute that I put something in front of my recovery, uh, I'm impairing the very thing that, that, that enables me to, to achieve and enjoy uh, the things that I want in life. Uh, they commit in word and action to their own recovery. In other words, they walk the talk. Uh, they have more recovery than we have. Well, that kind of goes without saying. And if you look back at uh, our older literature, uh, our old sponsorship booklet prior to sponsorship, what's in it for me, it's out of print these days. But one of the things that it talked about in there was a suggestion that the minimum requirement for uh, becoming a sponsor wasn't having worked through the 12 steps, wasn't two years in Codependence Anonymous, wasn't uh, anything along those lines. What it was was that, the, the, that that person had done a fifth step. And the thinking there was that if someone has done the fifth step, well, they're far enough ahead of the newcomer that they can at the very least walk them through those first three steps. Uh, and then after that, all they've got to do is stay one step ahead of their sponsee. So that's that idea of, of having more recovery than, than the potential sponsee. Uh, they actively work the, co the 12 steps of CODA. Uh, I mean, CODA is a one step or it's a one trick pony. You know, those patterns of CODA patterns, um, uh, those are actually good news to me because they describe me to a T. And, and what we have in this fellowship is a 12-step program of recovery that is absolutely tailored to helping somebody who looks like that. Uh, that idea that it, it works if you work it, uh, but only if you work it. So if I want recovery, I want my guide to be somebody who is working in recovery. Um, 
a, a characteristic of a CODA sponsor, know the tw CODA 12 traditions and apply them in their lives. Uh, the uh, 12 step, uh, or sorry, 12 piece relationship toolkit is based specifically on that idea. Um, if the only requirement for membership in CODA uh, is a desire for healthy and loving relationships, then, then I would submit the argument that the 12 traditions are at least as important to those of us in CODA as, as the 12 steps are. Uh, because the 12 traditions are guides to and tools for healthier relationships. So if, if I'm in CODA because I have a desire for healthy and loving relationships, then those 12 traditions are like gold to me. Uh, problem, of course, being that, that the 12 steps would seem to be prerequisites. Uh, I've in 16 years in CODA, I have not seen anybody successfully apply the traditions in their life on a sustained basis, unless they had first worked the 12 steps. But uh, we can learn to apply the traditions as we're going through the steps and a good sponsor will be somebody who can help me to do that. Um, another characteristic is that they exhibit a recovery program that we want for ourselves. Okay. That's just a summary of everything I've just said. Um, they are the same gender as we are, um, but then it goes on to say are not sexually attractive to us, which for some of our members raises an issue. And, and, and one of the, uh, other pieces of our literature talks about looking for a sponsor who is not of the gender that we would normally date, whatever that looks like to us. Uh, and, and the idea there is that romantic connections of any sort or even romantic temptations have a tendency to get in the way of, uh, of recovery. So we just want to take that right off the table. You know, um, for most of us, it's, it's men sponsor men and women sponsor women. But at the end of the day, it's people sponsor people. Uh, maintain personal boundaries in a non-aggressive manner. I kind of like this one because it's a pretty good litmus test of uh, I think of someone's progress in recovery is when they can maintain personal boundaries without being aggressive about it. Um, and, and what that looks like is uh, uh, I won't be able to uh, call you on Sundays because that's my family time. As opposed to uh, uh I'm not going to take calls from you on Sunday because that's, uh, that's my family time and uh, this reason and this reason and this reason and this reason and you don't want to interfere with my family time because that's why, what my recovery is all about. Um, uh, that's one small example. But uh, when, I'm, when I see uh, uh, someone who is, is in my face about their boundaries as opposed to just setting a boundary. Um, that's typically not someone that, that I'm going to go to for help. Uh, they are emotionally present. Uh, one of the most important things that a sponsor does is listen. And what we learn in, in recovery is active listening, which means actually being in the room with the person who's talking to us. Uh, they're open-minded and that's just, again, another, another indicator of progress in recovery, in my mind. Um, I mean, how many of us arrive with, with uh, complete black and white thinking? You're for me or you're against me. Uh, it's good or it's bad. Uh, it's black or it's white. And, and you know, the problem with the black and white thinking is that life happens in the grays. And, and uh, so I want, I want somebody who is open to that. Um, they accept themselves and accept us. You know, a, a big chunk of that, and I'll talk about it later, is self-talk. 
but uh, I got here with uh, you know, being Richard's number one critic. And I really, I, I, I needed a lot of help from somebody who had learned not to do that. Uh, sorry, just making a note for myself. Uh, another characteristic of a good sponsor, uh, they are equals and treat us as equals. So sponsorship is, as it said uh, from the piece that I read earlier, is, is a partnership. Uh, one of the things that we talk about with the traditions is uh, in applying those uh, personally is, is in tradition five, looking for the primary purpose in a relationship. And I, I, to my mind, the primary purpose in my sponsorship relationships is to enhance both our recoveries by working the steps and, and by sharing with each other. And, uh, that's, that's, it's not dictating, it's sharing. And that's done between equals. Uh, a good sponsor respects our right to confidentiality. I mean, you know, reference the last half of our name, anonymous. I mean, we, in, in recovery, we are all about the confidentiality. One of the, uh, uh things that, that, we come into uh, recovery with is a huge distrust of other people. And it's typically because we've got a history of trusting the wrong people. And a lot of times that manifests in, in people using uh, our intimate conversations against us. And so what I'm looking for in a sponsor is somebody who who I can trust with those intimate uh, details of my life. Uh, and that doesn't happen all at once. It has to happen as a process. Uh, and a good sponsor will cultivate that process by being trustworthy. Um, they will listen with compassion and understanding without rescuing or giving advice. Um, what we do, what we do in our fellowship is we we don't dictate we don't give advice uh, we we make suggestions which is a little different but mostly what we do is we share our experience strength and hope oh that's what you're going through well, I went through the same thing and this is what I did and this is how it turned out and you know, when I share that sometimes the guy that I'm talking to will say oh. That's a good idea. Uh, maybe I'll give that a try. Or sometimes when I talk about this is what happened and this is uh, what I did about it and this is how it turned out, they'll say, oh, well, thanks for the warning. Holy cow, I'm not going to do that. But either way, uh, my job in that, in that scenario is to share my experience and my strength and my hope. Um, they help us to identify codependent behavior in a supportive and non-shaming manner. And this is where uh, one of the things that I have to give my sponsor is a, uh, uh, an unlicensed or sorry, an, un, an unrestricted license to be honest um, is, is the way that I think of it. Uh, my sponsor's job is to love me enough to tell me the truth about what he sees, not to tell me what, I, what I'm comfortable with or what I want to hear. And sometimes what that means is that I'm not going to like what I hear from my sponsor, but that's when it's most important that, that uh, uh, he be able to speak up to me, but he, he'll do that in a, as it says, a supportive and non-shaming manner. Uh, part of my job into that and it references back to what I said before is to not take it personally to understand that this man is trying to help me and wants the best for me uh, and that's the only reason that he's raising it as an issue uh, a good code of sponsor accepts that we might be working more than one program uh, 
I, I mentioned before, we are the crossroads of recovery. This thing started when some folks in Arizona who had been long-term clean and sober in AA and NA uh, realized that they, they still had problems and that, that uh, uh, most of those problems seemed to revolve around their relationships with other people. And so everybody who founded CODA uh, all of our early members were also members of other fellowships and and uh, we continue to look a lot like that today uh, almost everybody that I know in coda is is in at least one other fellowship uh, I happen to be uh, uh, in the minority in coda in that uh, while I am in another fellowship I started in coda i didn 't start in another fellowship and come here um, and in fact, I, based on our literature, I ended up going to another fellowship to find a sponsor because the group that I started with was me and six women who terrified me. Uh, and, our, and that old sponsorship booklet talked about if you, if you can't find a potential sponsor in your own group, then, well, next look at other CODA groups. And if there aren't any other CODA groups, then you might want to uh, go to another fellowship uh, and find a sponsor who at least understands the steps and traditions. And that's what I ended up doing for my first sponsor. Uh, a, good con a good sponsor accepts and res respects our pace. Um, you know, our, our meeting opening talks about how it's an individual growth process, uh, that we each grow at our own rate. And uh, that is so important. Um, I, I personally am not a fan of, of uh, group step work for that reason, uh, because uh, somebody's always either hurrying uh, or being held back. Uh, when when you've got a group of people working the steps together. That's just my opinion. And I, it's important that I point out that it's my opinion. Your mileage may vary. But uh, I think that a good sponsor uh, does not impose someone else's schedule on me. Uh, a good sponsor provides loving support for us and encourages us to reach out to others. Um, in, in NorCal, they have a little bit of literature talking about the uh, uh, rule of five, where it, it talks about establishing a little network of recovery people around you with, with at least five people. Um, and it's based on that idea that my recovery can't be based on an attachment to just one person. Um, and it is, it, it is, while my sponsor is the primary person that I turn to for guidance uh, and support, uh, it's important to me that I also have other sources because my sponsor is not all-knowing. And uh, I'll, I'll get into uh, that dynamic a little later, but... Um, Another piece of that is that it's important that I don't put my sponsor up on a pedestal uh, because inevitably we find out that sponsors are human. And uh, if, if I have my sponsor up on the pedestal, which at one time I did, and it becomes clear to me that, that they are human, that's a bit of a traumatic experience. Uh, fortunately, the second time that happened, I'd already been through it the first time, and and, and uh, so my my second sponsor, being human, uh, wasn't as big a surprise, and I handled it much better. And I'm currently on my third sponsor, and I got into that relationship knowing ahead of time that he was human, and that therefore he was going to make mistakes. So, uh, uh, I guess if I had that all to do over again. Uh, I would want to go into that first relationship knowing that I was dealing with a human and not, and not uh, uh, some sort of icon. Um, so learn from my mistake. <laughs> uh, another characteristic of CODA sponsor is that they communicate clearly and directly. Um, I may be do doing, I may be serving as a bad example of that today. Um, 
And one of my favorites, the characteristic of a CODA sponsor, they ask us questions for clarity, not to control, judge, or manipulate us. One of the things that, that I was taught in how to, how to be a sponsor is to ask lots of questions. Because when we're asked questions, we've got to think about the answer. And a lot of times when my sponsor asks me enough questions, um, I come up with my own answers. I don't, I, I don't need an answer from him. I just need the right questions. Uh, a good sponsor uh, has a sense of humor. I think that is so important. Um, wow. One of the things that, that is a litmus test for me, and I think of it as the seventh step in action, is that, uh, is that sense of humor that... Uh, how do I know when a, a defect of character has been removed? Well, it's when it becomes funny. Uh, you know, when the, when the thing that, that I, I was sabotaging my own life with becomes a belly laugh, it's not in control anymore. And I want a sponsor who sees the humor in the things that he's done and maybe even the humor in the things that I'm doing um, because that means that, that he's found a way out. And if he's found a way out, there is a way out. Um, a good sponsor knows how to play. Well, one of the reasons we get into recovery in the first place is that we're not enjoying life. And you know, isn't, isn't that at the end of the day where we want to get to is, is to uh, a life that we enjoy. And part of enjoying life has to be uh, being able to play. So. Ten minutes. Oh, we're sh ten minutes. According to my clock, it's 20 minutes. <laughs> right. If you want to leave time for questions, or we can delay the questions until the next hour, as you wish. Okay. Well, I thought that's what we were doing. Um, I'm sorry if I've if I've been uh, pacing this badly uh, uh, due to a misunderstanding. So, how do we ask for sponsorship? Um, Seven tradition tells us that that uh, we want to strive to be self-supporting. Um, that doesn't just mean financially, it means uh, emotionally and physically, and yes, spiritually. And that means that asking for sponsorship is the sponsee's responsibility. And what we suggest is that, that we do that uh, in an open, honest, and direct manner. And I talked a little bit about that earlier, going to somebody and saying, I love the recovery that I see in you. Would you please show me how you did that? Uh, or uh, I love the way that you talk about the steps. Do you have time in your life to take me through them? But something along those lines, open, honest, and direct. And if they say no, uh, understand that it's not about you, that it, uh, they, they, they perhaps have something going on in their life or they are – literally snowed down with, with too many sponsees or uh, whatever, but it's not about you. And, and so look around and, and go to the next person. Um, so when you're looking around the rooms for that, for that person, bottom line is you want to be looking for somebody who is committed to their own recovery who is immersed in the steps and traditions um, has a sponsor. I mean, if, if I'm going to somebody to be my guide through this spiritual process, I want to know that they got a guide. Um, and, and maybe it goes without saying, but they go to meetings that they are. They, <laughs> you see them in the meetings on a regular basis. Uh, it, it's a little hard to be a sponsor in CODA if you're not going to CODA. 
So maybe the most important stuff that we can talk about today, though, is, is how can a sponsee make the most about, uh, of their relationship once they've got a sponsor? Um, there's really just four points that, that I wanted to talk about here. Um, one, pick up the phone. Um, that idea of, of uh, if you have a sponsor, use a sponsor. Um, I, I have a bunch of guys that I get to sponsor. And then there's another group of guys, a very large group of guys out there who call me their sponsor, but they don't call me. And, you know, it's okay with me if they call me their sponsor. Um, um, and I hope that eventually they give me an opportunity to sponsor them. But until they actually reach out, uh, and, and take that step, it, it's a little difficult to, to do my job. Uh, consistency on the part of the sponsee. Um, and what that means is that, uh, and I've, I talk about it a lot in, in, in newcomer meetings. So when I, when I looked around the rooms, the people who had what I wanted, uh, all kind of did the same things. Um, they, they were regular attendees at the meetings and they had a sponsor and they talked about those 12 steps, uh, from the point of view of having done them. So one of the, one of the pieces of that is, is that, that they were always at the meetings. Um, so I treat my meetings like a doctor's appointment. That idea that that uh, you know, Monday nights at, at seven o'clock, um, my butt is in a chair in the basement of Home Street Mennonite Church in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, uh, unless I am sick, uh, out of town, or or being of service somewhere. But those are the those are the the three excuses for not making it to the meeting. Um, then self-talk. One of the things that, that I think uh, a sponsee can do to uh, be a better sponsee is to pay attention to their own self-talk. Because here's the thing is that uh, I, I said before, when I first came into recovery, uh, Richard's biggest critic was Richard. Um, and through watching my sponsor and, and uh, uh, getting support from, from that, I've been able to turn that around to a great degree. You know, it's been a long time since I, I, I spoke to the guy in the mirror about what an idiot he is. And what I've been able to do is to transform that into, um, well, Richard, that, that didn't turn out well. Um, Maybe next time we should do it differently. Or my personal favorite these days is, well, Richard, that was suboptimal. Let's try something different next time. But uh, one of the things that happens is that if I get caught up in that self-criticism and beating up on myself, uh, it becomes a little bit of a cycle. I will notice that I'm beating up on myself. And I've been in Dakota a long time, and I'm not supposed to be doing that. And now I'm beating up on myself for beating up on myself. Um, and while I'm beating up on myself, I'm not doing anything about the actual problem. And it's a huge distraction. So one of the things that we can do to be better open to the help that we get from our sponsor is to keep an eye on our own self-talk. And maybe the most important thing I think that, that we can do as sponsees is to make a commitment, not to our sponsor, but to ourselves. Uh, and I call it a commitment to consideration. Um, and that is that this, uh, I've, I've carefully selected somebody to be my spiritual guide. Um, because uh, clearly the way that I was thinking and doing things wasn't working. So this person has exhibited all of the successes that I want to achieve. It seems ill-advised for me to ignore what they have to say. 
So a commitment to consideration. Whatever my sponsor says to me, I may disagree with it. I am free to disagree with it. It's a relationship of equals. But it's really important that I at least consider it. And I need to remind myself when I don't like what I hear from my sponsor that uh, that I've made that commitment and to take a second look at it. Um, the story I like to tell around that is my, my current sponsor, is, I mentioned before, is my third sponsor. Um, and when that relationship was new, my very first phone call to him um, included a little exchange where, you know, I got this new sponsor and I'm codependent. I want to impress my sponsor. So I told him a little story about about a cute little thing that I was doing in the meetings that, that uh, I found was, was uh, entertaining because it really annoyed certain people that, that bothered me in the meeting. And the phone went dead for a second. And uh, he said, you know, Richard, that's, uh, that's pretty funny. Um, I might even do that myself. Um, under the right circumstances. But, you know, if you're doing that just to show your disdain for their opinion or, or, or their approach to the situation, we don't do that. And I said, um, I got to go. Click. Hung up. And five minutes later, I, I called him back. And I said, Jack, it's been a very long time since anybody held me accountable. I didn't like it before and I don't like it now, but apparently it's necessary. So thank you. You know, that commitment to consider what this guy that I've carefully selected has to say, um, had me look at my behavior and, and come to a, a new perspective. So those are the things that, that I think are really important that a sponsee can do to make best use of their sponsor. Um, one of the things we also want to talk about is, is different types of sponsorship because there are more than one kind of sponsorship re relationship. Um, the sponsorship that we've mainly been talking about uh, is, is essentially personal sponsorship um, where we, you know, we select somebody and we're going to go walk through the steps with them. But th there, there are variants on that that show up in our literature like co-sponsorship. Uh, co-sponsorship began when in the early days of Kodo when when there were not a lot of long timers around, and uh, so you didn't have a bunch of people with with long experience with the Kodo steps, and there was a great need for sponsors. And so two people who were at about the point in the same point in recovery would uh, essentially sponsor each other. And I, I got to tell you that in addition to having a sponsor, I also have a co-sponsor, uh, Ian B. in Saskatoon, uh, who is going to be moderating today, is my co-sponsor and has been for 15 years. Um, that's been a really rewarding relationship because it gives me somewhere else to go when my sponsor is busy. Um, co-sponsorship is built on one simple premise, that we're not both sick on the same day. Uh, another type of sponsorship is uh, is temporary sponsorship, and that is uh, uh, a temporary sponsor is just somebody who can get us going in the steps while we look around for a sponsor. Typically, there's there are people uh, you know in our group uh, we ask people in our sign in book and in our phone list to self identify with an asterisk by their name, saying that they're willing to be a temporary sponsor. And, uh, the beauty of that is that it seems for a lot of newcomers to have, uh, that, that it's easier to ask somebody to be our temporary sponsor than it is to ask them to be our sponsor. Uh, and sometimes those relationships become permanent. Often they become permanent. Um, I can tell you that there's uh, three or four guys that I, I have been their temporary sponsor in excess of 10 years. Um, Shared sponsorship is another thing, uh, and, and that is a case where where someone uh, um, uh, essentially gives two people permission to talk about them. Uh, 
uh, and sometimes that that will be um, useful for example when uh, uh, a young woman came into uh, the fellowship and wanted me for a sponsor well it's difficult for me to sponsor women of any age uh, however uh, my wife and I took her on as uh, as shared sponsorship and what that did was it it gave her whatever comfort she found from from uh, having me as a sponsor but uh with access to uh, uh my wife's insights and wisdom um and what we do in that kind of situation is we explicitly get that person's permission to discuss them uh, with each other. And apart from that, I, I don't discuss the people that I sponsor with my wife and she doesn't discuss the, the people that she sponsors with me. Uh, long distance sponsorship is another variant. Um, uh, sometimes in, in an isolated coda group, there just, there just is nobody, uh, uh, especially in a new group, uh, that's suitable for sponsorship. Um, uh, in which case it is really useful to be able to reach out over the phone lines to uh, a group in a neighboring province or state or, or somewhere around the world. I've, I've had a number of long distance sponsorship relationships. My current sponsor is a long distance relationship. Um, but uh, I can tell you that from experience when possible, I prefer to be eyeball to eyeball with the guy that I'm sponsoring and with my sponsor. Um, so it's it, not, while it's what I'm doing, it's not my preference. Um, then service sponsorship and service sponsorship is about that idea of uh, serving really beyond the group level. When we get involved at the voting entity level and at the code of service conference, uh, things can get pretty intense in a hurry from a service perspective. And it, it's really useful to find a service sponsor, to find somebody who has done the job that I'm doing before and, uh, and can tell me the ins and outs of doing it. Uh, much like working the steps. You know, uh, uh, when, I, when I get involved in service to CODA at a, at a more involved level. Um, it, it's helpful to have a guide. And finally, um, how can we break up with a sponsor? When is it appropriate to break up with a sponsor? Um, we need to understand going in that sponsorship is not a life sentence. That uh, you know, we're, we're not making a, a taking an oath uh, about uh, being with that person until death do us part. Um, uh, needs change, people change. Um, sometimes, you know, if, if a sponsor moves away and, and the sponsee doesn't want to engage in a long distance uh, sponsorship relationship, uh, then it's appropriate to end that relationship and, and find a local sponsor. When I moved from Saskatoon to Winnipeg, uh, I had a few guys that I was sponsoring in Saskatoon that wanted somebody that was across the table from them at the meeting. That's absolutely fine. And as a, as a sponsor, my job in that is again, don't take it personally. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, sometimes we will outgrow a sponsor. That's what happened to me with my first sponsor. Is that, you know, when I first came in, uh, I was pretty fragile. And what my first sponsor gave me was nothing but unconditional love and, and, and encouragement. Not a lot of guidance, but uh, unconditional love and, and acceptance. I, mean, I like to say that I'm pretty sure that it, I could have phoned him up one night and said, uh, I don't know what happened. I, 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 she, she just, she wouldn't shut up and I, and, and I had an ax in my head and now there's blood all over the place and I, and I, I feel horrible. And, and, and his response would have been, aren't you being a little hard on yourself? You know, and that's, that literally is what I needed at that time because I was so fragile. But then I, 
I healed a little bit and I, I got to the point where what I really needed was some guidance through the steps. And he was not very uh, strong on the, on the guidance through the steps thing. And so I ended up uh, going to uh, a, a different sponsor and uh, where I got some guidance and uh, my responsibility in that was to go to my first sponsor and thank him to say that, you know, uh, uh, thank you for getting me this far. And uh, I really appreciate everything that you've done for me. And I'm going to be going with this guy now. And uh, uh, again, uh, as a, as a sponsor, I have had a couple of guys at times come to me with that same idea. And my job in that is, is to not take it personally. If anything, I take it as a compliment that I, you know, I helped this guy outgrow me. How cool is that? So if you are relatively new in CODA and you are looking around the rooms right now for a sponsor, um, my experience with that is that I was terrified. Uh, my fear of rejection uh, was riding my shoulders all the time. But I'll let you in on a little secret. Anybody in those rooms who, who is a good candidate for a sponsor is more than willing to be a sponsor. They may be too busy. They may not. They may not be able to say yes, but if they can, they will. It's that simple. Secretly, the people who who you're looking at in those rooms are saying to themselves, "Man, I hope they ask me." But because of tradition seven, because it's the the sponsee's responsibility to ask, they're not going to you and saying, "Hey, I'll be your sponsor." They are waiting for you to come and ask but they really do want to be there for you. So that's what I have to say about uh, how to be sponsored. Um, uh, what do we do now, Linda? Do we take a five minute break and then come back for questions or what do we do? Now, thank you. Let's have 20 minutes for questions. I'll keep the recording on for 20 minutes, at which point I'll turn the okay. recording off. And uh, people, if you would like to ask a question, you can press star six asterisk six on your uh, cell phones or uh, unmute some other way on your uh, screen and uh, thank you Richard for this presentation okay I guess I'd like to ask a question about service sponsorship, Richard. Could you yes, uh, could you give an example of, of some kind of uh, service uh, sponsorship that you've done? Uh, I have not been a, a service sponsor. I have a service sponsor. Um, uh, and the situation uh, there is, is uh, really having somebody who can, who, who can talk to me uh, about, first of all, how to do the job. But also, when I run into a problem, I've got someone who's likely solved that same problem before that I can go to and, and say, this is what's going on. Uh, any ideas? And he'll say to me, well, yeah, you know, when that happened to me, I did this. Just, just, just like a personal sponsor, except focused on the, uh, the business side of what we do. Well, the chat is saying thank you. Uh, Leidani and Kina are using the chat for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I see people who want to ask questions. Anna, did you want to ask a question? Nancy? Yes, I, I have a question. Well, it's really kind of commenting, sort of tagging on the back of yours, Linda. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting idea because doing the, the board service that I'm doing right now, uh, I've not done it before, and the concept of of asking someone who's done that job before to be your service sponsor is very intriguing to me. How does one get around the the idea of confidentiality 
Um, so some of those roles, you know, there is a confidentiality issue. Mm -hmm. Is is it the same protocol that you would have, obviously, in a in a regular sponsee sponsor, sponsor uh, relationship? That you you know you just assume that that person is going to be confidential about the information you share. I th I th I think in that scenario, being in your position, Nancy, where where you have that obligation for board confidentiality, um, would be to uh, be clear uh, with that person who's going to be your your service sponsor about whether uh, whether they even want to discuss stuff that that reaches that level of confidentiality. Um, but if they're willing to, then yeah, I mean, basically, it's got to be like a like an uh, an oath of silence. <laughs> okay, thank you. But yeah, I had never heard of that before, and that's uh, very very useful. Thank you very much. Well, I I have a job in my other in my other fellowship that I'll tell you I couldn't I couldn't navigate without a service sponsor. <laughs> Anna, did you want to ask a question? I see Anna M has also uh, unmuted her microphone. Anna M. Thank you, Mika. Thank you, Richard, sure. for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, the question is. Um, should or would a uh, sponsor help me to go through the traditions at the same time I am working the steps? Absolutely. Um, uh, what I what I tend to do is as as a sponsor is when I when I take a guy through the fifth step, uh, I will. Uh, and with a little conversation that includes, okay, now it's time to get serious about the traditions. If, if they haven't, if they haven't already come to me about the traditions, uh, I start talking to them about it right then. Uh, does that help? Anna? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, I find it hard to believe that I've been so informative that there's no questions. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will tell you guys that uh, this went a little differently than I had anticipated, and, and, and this doing it uh, without a, a, a crowd in front of me uh, really kind of threw me. Uh, so I hope to do a little better tomorrow. But uh, I had I, I had a couple of visuals that uh, I uh, had prepared and and somehow um, never thought to actually put them up on screen. So uh, I will share right now uh, one of those. Uh, it's the idea of why I need a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is Lou, um, in New Brunswick. Yep. Um, I have a few questions. I'm in a, a location. I just moved from one province to the next. And the location I'm in, um, there's no code of meetings here. I'm going to a, a local Al Anon meeting, which is very small. And um, suggestions for uh, a, lo a long distance sponsor. Do you have any? Absolutely. Um, best thing yeah. that, that, that I can suggest is to um, to make contact, even if it's uh, within your on, you're doing online meetings. I think you said right. No, it's I'm I'm not going to a CODA meeting at this moment. I'm okay. just attending a local Al-Anon meeting, which okay. is the only thing going right now in this place. Okay, well, uh, Nancy can fill you in about uh, some online meetings, uh, give, give you some connection to the CODA community there, uh, and as well as uh, even just stuff like this, making connections with 
with people who uh, have been around Coda for a while uh, and can make some suggestions to people that you might want to talk to. I mean, I would have a, a list of uh, probably a, uh, three or four guys that you might want to consider calling uh, and, and getting to know. And, and that's how you would start that is, I mean, the nice thing about CODA is that we typically love to talk to other CODA members. Um, and so, uh, you know, if I give you Ian's phone number in Saskatoon, uh, uh, which I'll be happy to do over email, but not on here, um, uh, he would love to get to know you. And if you get to know him and you say, okay, this is, this is a guy who, 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 approach to recovery appeals to me then now you've got somebody that you can talk to on that basis yeah um we, you're going to give us your email at the end then and i can send you an email to request yeah. information. yeah i will i will give uh my email right now that is r-i-t-c-h r-i-t-c-h dot i-s dot i-s at gmail.com at gmail.com Thank you. Um, before I moved here, um, I'd been, I've been going to CODA for several years and I had a, a long-term sponsor and uh, I had um, I had decided to discontinue the sponsorship. Um, I was starting to feel like um, I was starting not to trust my own thinking um, because of uh, the relationship for some reason. Um, so I haven't had a sponsor for a couple of years because I'm just not sure about, um, it's like, I don't want to trust another person, um, or just want a bit more freedom in the relationship. If I felt like I had to talk a certain way and had to ask questions in a certain way. And, um, there were elements that were like really, controlling and they, they bothered me um it was for good purpose and, and it helped me um it helped me learn that i needed to ask for experience strength and hope and stay in the in solution-based recovery rather than um you know just talking about problems which, which is easy to do um and yet yeah I, I just felt there was just something really controlling about it and and i felt like i had to check my decision making and get some kind of approval with, um, with my sponsor. Um, can you speak to any kind of relationship difficulties with sponsorship like that? Well, um, again, every sponsorship relationship is between two unique people. Certainly. Uh, um, it sounds to me as if, uh, uh, perhaps the sponsor that you were dealing with uh, uh, wasn't adapting necessarily to what what you uh, needed in that relationship, um, which happens. I mean, it, um, either they didn't recognize, or they weren't, or they weren't will willing to adapt to a different uh, kind of need, um, and. Ultimately, that's okay because nobody can tell you what to do in your recovery. You make those final decisions. Mm. Uh, I, I, I preface an incredible number of uh, conversations with sponsees with, uh, uh, I can't tell you what to do, but this is what I see. <laughs> do with that what you will. Um. Now, with that said, uh, if, that, if that sponsee is uncomfortable hearing what I see, um, as a sponsor, I got to remember that that's okay. There is no growth without discomfort. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying things to make him uncomfortable. Um, uh, but I'm not shying away from making him uncomfortable uh, in order to protect his feelings. That's what codependents do. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I was afraid to detach from the person because I realized I was, I was very loyal. And that was one of my patterns of codependency. Um, uh huh. <laughs> loyalty to beyond, beyond. Uh, well, and, and, and as codependents, when our, when our illness is active, I mean, one of the most uh, paralyzing things is the, the, the suspicion that somebody somewhere might disapprove of us. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd received much, I'd received much, but I, in the end, I had to go through that and risk somebody else's displeasure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and I'll just, I'll just close off with that, you know, maybe that was a necessary part of the growth in that relationship was for you to go through that discomfort and, and be able to walk through uh, disengaging that, uh, that relationship. Because look what you accomplished there. Something that, that was outside your comfort zone, right? Yes. You're right. Can, Can anyone hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to speak to the no meeting in New Brunswick. There is a, this is Nancy. Mm-hmm. There is a, a CODA meeting out of St. John, New Brunswick. I'm not really sure where you live in New Brunswick. Actually, I'd made some inquiries, Nancy, when I first came here, and uh, I live in Negwak. Okay. And uh, I'm just out of range. And uh, yeah, that'd be a to bit too far to travel. Not on but a regular. There's also the an online meeting that's being hosted out of uh, Saint John, but uh, hosted by Coda Canada. So if you are interested, just reach out to me. I'll leave my my email. <laughs> Uh, in the chat and okay. anyone else for that matter who's interested in participating Thank I'll leave you very my much, email Nancy. so I'll leave it at that and someone else had a question yes, Anna, can you hear me Anna has yep. questions um, uh, the first question that Anna wanted to ask was how many meetings should one attend before they start looking for a sponsor and uh, then there's a second one I would there's no there's no cut and dried rule there uh i have seen very successful sponsorship relationships start with somebody showing up at their first meeting and latching on to the first person who would help them uh on the other hand it 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 seems sensible to just get to know a couple of people before making a decision of of that import but uh, and that that's one of the questions that does get asked often by newcomers is when should I get how long should I wait before I get a sponsor? And uh, you know it, it sounds a little flippant, but it's really accurate. I, I I think the appropriate answer to that is is how how soon do you want to get well? Uh, so, so to follow up on that, um, Anna says you know it says uh, look for a sponsor who has what you want, but what about the fact that it, really we don't know too much about the sponsor unless you enter the relationship, even if you have a talk beforehand? What about that? What do you call it? Well, and that's why why I mentioned not just going to the meeting, but engaging in the fellowship around the meeting. And and uh, I like I personally like groups that go for coffee uh, after the meeting. Because that, that's the meeting after the meeting. It's an opportunity to get to know people in the group uh, uh, outside of that structured meeting environment. But uh, even if it's just a case, uh, if you've got a group that doesn't meet for coffee, invite someone for coffee. Get to know them. Uh, do that a couple of times. And, and it's just about gathering information before we make an informed decision. And so does the Winnipeg group go for coffee? We actually stay for coffee. We, we, we do, we kind of break up into little conversation groups after the meeting and, and the coffee is on and, and uh, typically it takes us uh, close to an hour to get out of the, the, uh, uh, facility after the meetings ended. Wow, thank you. Uh, t- Sally, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I just accidentally hung up, so I had to get back on with you. Phew. 
Um, I'm in California, and our meetings are fairly small. Sometimes there's only two people, and last couple of times we had like 10 or 11. It was very exciting. Anyhow, there are six of us that did a group conscience uh, about sponsorship because there were three people there that have been Dakota for a while and three people that were pretty new, myself being one of them. And so what we did is three people are working on the green book and three of us are working the 30 questions. Okay. And last, last Wednesday, where I live is very hot and I was absolutely exhausted and I just couldn't get it together to go to my meeting. But part of that was that I've been struggling and really simply didn't want to go. So I have come to realize that I probably need more than a group sponsorship thing. I need more of a one-on-one, -on -one, which is why I'm listening in with you guys today. Um, there's nobody really in our group, maybe one person, and if I can get enough guts, I can ask her. But there's a part of me that feels that these people have so much on their plate sometimes that I don't want to add one more person to their plate by asking them to be my sponsor. And I'm wondering maybe the possibility of a long distance sponsor, someone that I could talk to on the phone might be a better deal for me. And I was just wondering how you felt about that. Uh, and, and that may well be if, if you, if you can't find a suitable sponsor in your group uh, and there's no neighboring group to go to, then our literature suggests looking at a wider field and, and that results in long distance sponsorship. Uh, the other thing that I would caution you about though uh, is uh, one of the things we do as, as codependents is that we make decisions for other people. And uh, I, would, I would caution you against deciding ahead of time that uh, one of these people who, who is interesting to you is too busy for you. That happens all the time in our, in our rooms. And uh, you know, frankly, uh, one of the things that we learn by sponsoring people is good boundaries. Uh, and one of the ways that we learn that is by, is by recognizing if we're too busy to take someone on. It's, okay. So it's their responsibility to have that boundary. It's your responsibility to ask. You, okay. If, if you follow me. Yes, so, I do. so I I would suggest that that uh, uh, I, before you discount the people who are right in front of you, uh, give them a chance to tell you they're too busy. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, given the worst case scenario, she tells me she's too busy. So then, what would be my next step? Well, then I would suggest. Uh, uh, if you have some time tomorrow to uh, 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 even if you don't participate, just listen. Um, but uh, uh, tomorrow's session, which is about how to sponsor will be full of people who are interested in being sponsors. Okay. Uh, yeah. I was planning on being here tomorrow too. Okay. And, and consequently I'm, I'm, certain there would be somebody there tomorrow that you could make contact with. Well, that sounds wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Richard. I'm yeah. not certain whether the illustrations that you're going to go through are going to come through on the, uh, the chat that's attached to the recording. So may I suggest that I end the meeting and end the recording and then you go over those? Would you mind doing it that way or otherwise we could continue and listen while you explain uh, the illustrations? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, sure, Ken can do for anybody that's interested uh, and uh, by the way you, you can download a copy of that at uh, tiny.cc slash coda sponsor 2 that's tiny 
dot cc at coda sponsor no, no, not at slash oh yeah. <laughs> tiny oh. dot cc slash coda sponsor two. Oh, all righty i've typed that into the uh chat yeah that's exactly right <laughs> so all right so then let me just uh Wind things up officially here by saying that uh, tomorrow Richard will give the second part of this uh, forum and uh, he will talk about how to sponsor, thank goodness, and that next month uh, we will revert to our end of the month, uh, last Saturday of the month, July 27th, uh, scheduled with a presentation by Kathy L. and Lou L. on reaching suffering codependents who are captive audiences. So... I'd like to close with the uh, code of closing prayer. We thank our higher power for all that we have received, we have received from this meeting. this meeting. As we close, As we close may we take, may with, take us with us the wisdom, the wisdom, wisdom love, love, acceptance, acceptance and, and hope of recovery. Of recovery.